You know, I like the laser sight. I think you can really have some fun. Last week, we showed you the advanced Taser M-Series weapon at CES. This is an amazing device used by law enforcement uh, for control of uh, violent suspects, people who just won't stand still. It's non-lethal. It's not dangerous to the, the suspect, but uh, it's pretty darn effective. Um, I know Marty and uh, I talked about it on the show also because the, the new development from uh, the Taser folks is they're going to offer these also to individuals. We've got the CEO from Taser International, Rick Smith, here to join us to talk about the new Tasers. Rick, it's great to have you. Welcome. Thanks. Good to be here. Um, this got a lot of news attention when you announced this last week. What was the announcement that Taser made? Well, the big announcement was United Airlines is putting these in all their cockpits as part of their in-flight security. The pilots will have these. The pilots will have two in each cockpit. And there is also a non-police version of this now available. It's not in every state. It's not legal in every state, right? right? It's, it's legal in 43 states, and okay. there's no permits required in those states. Okay. Uh, pretty amazing stuff. Before we go any further, though, I really want to emphasize this is not... A toy. This is a non-lethal weapon. It's used by law enforcement. It's not a gun. We are going to show you some demos of how this thing works, but they were per performed in a controlled environment. We took a lot of precautions. Rick knows exactly what he's doing. We guarantee the safety of all the participants by taking those precautions. This is not something you want to play with at home. This, is a, this thing hurts like the dickens, okay? Uh, let's talk about what this does. There's two, two ways to use it. Patrick was using it uh, at close range. Right, in the stun gun mode. Can I uh, do that now and just yep. flip off the safety? No, fl no flip it oh, back it up to it. arm it. All right. And squeeze the trigger. And then squeeze the trigger. And you can see there's a little uh, laser sight there. Uh, and then when I squeeze the trigger, there's a little charge that comes off. It looked a little like a little arcing. Charge. Yep. 50,000 uh, volts. How many volts? 50,000 volts. Okay. How many watts are coming out of it? Uh, 18 watts on this 18 particular 18 watts. Weapon. Now, it's very low amperage, so it's not harmful, right? Right. Won't affect the heart. Won't affect the pacemaker. But it causes your body to lock up. It's like uh, take a computer network. Imagine putting that spike of electricity into it. Right. It's going to send everything haywire. We do the same thing inside the human body, so the brain can't tell the arms, legs, and muscles what to do. And if you can't move, you can't attack anyone. Yeah. So it, it just it interrupts muscle activity. Right. Uh, it's called a neuromuscular disruptor. They a neuromuscular disruptor. And, yeah. and we, you know, before we let Yoshi do this, by the way, Yoshi looked. I know at a lot of websites. We looked at a lot of websites to make sure. And all the research says there is absolutely no evidence that there's any permanent damage or harm at all from this thing. Right? That's right. We've hit over 5,000 law enforcement volunteers, and they've hit over 1,200 bad guys in the field with it. This is no Hans. Adverse effect. Hans is uh, pretty tough. He's getting tased right now. Yeah, he's the former chief instructor of hand-to-hand -hand combat for the Marine Corps. So that tells you this is the type of guy you don't want to meet in a dark alley. Jeez. And uh, there's nothing else out there that would stop him. In fact, when we met him a couple of years ago, he was sort of famous for wrecking demonstrations and non-lethal weapons because this guy, you, you can't put him down. I mean, right. he took a grenade in combat and kept going, hit wow. from the grenade. So when we, uh, when we dropped him with this weapon, we knew we had the right recipe. That's pretty amazing. You were doing this on the show floor at CES. You were taking volunteers, right? Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, basically, that's nuts. I don't know who would do this, but all right. Well, basically what we did is we had a raffle every day where uh, we would offer to give a weapon away. And in order to qualify, you had to take a short one-second hit like we did with Yoshi. Uh, one of the biggest things we run into is people are just naturally terrified of electricity. And they're afraid, what, you know, is it going to electrocute me? Is it going to stop my heart? Right. It's, it's perfectly safe. But it's also important to feel if you're ever going to use this in the field, a lot of cases, it's good to know what it's going to do. And by giving them a short sample... They got an idea. Yeah, you can see how effective it is. It's kind of sad to see all these grown men cry, i got to tell you. This uh, has two m methods, though. We show the close-up method. Show me the long-range method. You can well, also do it uh, with a 15-foot range, right? Right. Basically, there you just snap cartridge in place. Okay. And we got a target on the wall here. Basically, at this point, you use the safety and the trigger exactly like you did before. Okay. Only now... Whoa! hi -oh. You can project force up to 15 feet. <laughs> so what's going on here is we've got a, these little projectiles. By the way, these are all uh, encoded with a serial number, a unique serial number. Yep. So law enforcement, if you went around using these, law enforcement would immediately know to trace yeah, it back. Yeah, you're leaving a calling card behind. So only use it when it's legitimate. And, you know, if you use it to rob a liquor store... They're going to know. They're going to know. Uh, these, these, uh, have, these little projectiles have a little straightened fish hook in them, right? Yeah. And that attaches. It doesn't have to get into their skin to do it, though, right? I mean, it could attach no. to clothing. As long as it catches in the clothing, uh, the electricity can jump up to two and a half inches to get into the skin. So I don't know if you want so to get close-up. Yeah, there's maybe the you can tip. see that. 
Now, if you're not wearing a shirt, if you're... That's going to hurt a little bit. <laughs> we, had a, we had a video that's pretty comical of a guy on PCP in L.A. running around naked with his pants around his ankles. Yeah. And when the police shot him with it, obviously it went into the skin. Right. But it leaves no more effect than a cactus needle right. when you pull it out. But it doesn't have to penetrate. As long as it's within two and a half inches, you'll get this same electric arc that'll jump from the tip of the dart through your clothing and into the body. These uh, wires are what uh, are transmitting it, right? Yeah, they're uh, insulated to 50,000 volts, and the wires, it's like mini jumper cables. Right. We launch it out, we <laughs> make the nice attachment, right. and, uh, well, it's descriptive. And, What's and, to stop a, a perpetrator from breaking those wires off? Uh, the 50,000 volts that's going through his body. <laughs> well, just in case you had any doubts about this, Yoshi said he'd take one for the show. And uh, should, we, should we take a look at this? Now, this, we, I want to say that we didn't do this live on the show because we weren't sure if there would be profanity involved. So we decided to do this before the show. We taped it before the show. Don't worry, Yoshi is, Yoshi's alive and well. He survived. But let's take a look at there. You're okay, right? A okay. All right. Let's take a look at uh, Yoshi getting tased. A brave, brave man. Okay. Oh, Ready? Yoshi. Ow! Ow! <laughs> He's laughing! He's laughing! He's twitching is what he's describe doing. Describe it. Um, what would be the best way to describe it? More. No, it just makes it... I felt like I couldn't move my legs. It, I don't You're know, still I felt shaking like someone a little was bit. Foot, like stepping on my foot. And <laughs> I just couldn't stand up. I tried to stand up. And you got about a half a second. Normally, the giggling is not normal. <laughs> no, I, I think you should consider a counselor. I, I've seen thousands of people hit with this, and never has never anybody a giggle. giggled when but, it's over. But Rick, you were nice to him. You just gave him a very brief burst, right. right? Normally, you would continue to pull that trigger for a few seconds until the person stopped. Oh, absolutely. When you hit the trigger, normally it runs for five seconds. I shut it off by flipping the safety okay. down. You did a very quick hit. Yeah. And, and you could, after the six seconds, if he moves, if he looks at you the wrong way, you can trigger it again. Keep them down. We had a case in Yuma County where the sheriff's had a guy immobilized for half an hour. Wow. I can see how law enforcement would love this, and uh, I guess there would be some application on the streets. But we, again, want to emphasize, folks, this is, this is not a toy. This is serious stuff, and it is legal in 43 states. But, uh, you know, I would recommend if you're going to get something like this, you get some training, you learn how to use it. You don't play around with this. this Absolutely. Is Most of our dealers have law enforcement officers that will come in and do training, yeah. so you know how to use it safely. Yeah. Hey, Rick, I really appreciate it. Rick Smith, CEO of Taser International. Yoshi, you're a better man than I am. Well done. Thank you very much. We want to stress the Taser is not a toy. It's a non-lethal weapon used by law enforcement. Those demos we showed you were performed again in a controlled environment. We took some real precautions. You saw I was actually holding Yoshi to protect him. Don't try it at home. It's nothing funny about it. For details on the Advanced Taser M series, go to the... Well, it's kind of funny, but that's Yoshi. Go to the screensavers.com. Com. <laughs> the new G4 can cost, what, 2400 bucks? Something like that. So $1699 you, for the low end. Kevin Rose went out and you built an OS 10 compatible PC. I did. I did. You did. Uh, let me show you what I did. Here, first, here's actually the running machine. It's running. And this is the final product sitting here. It looks like a PC, but actually it has uh, Macintosh components inside of it, and it's running OS 10.2. So, so, but it's not a Mac, though. It's well, it's not a Mac. It doesn't have the Mac case. It is all Mac components mm -hmm. that are actually Apple does sell. Well, they don't sell them directly, but they're um, you can find third party that do sell them. How did you track down all these parts? That's the together? tricky part. Really? The tricky part is finding all the components. I'll show you the first component we have here. This okay. is the actual motherboard of the G4, and we got this from a place called uh, Mac Rescue. And this is a standard G4 motherboard. It has the 10100 LAN on the side, uh, USB ports, mm -hmm. audio, everything a standard motherboard would have. Okay. That's the first component. I was able to track that down. After that, we go over here to the processor. Now, this is the, the core of the operating system. This is actually, or the operating system, the core of the computer. This is the 1 gigahertz with 2 megs of cache uh, Sonnet processor. And so is that actually an upgrade processor? That is an upgrade processor because you cannot buy these components directly from Apple. Okay. They won't sell you a processor if you go to apple.com. Okay. So I actually bought an upgrade processor from them. And then I went, uh, you have to actually have to find a CPU cooling fan as well for the processor because they're thinking it's an upgrade and they're thinking you already have the CPU cooling. But you don't. You don't because you're building one from scratch. Where did you find it? Because normally people don't really build these for, you know, over, nobody really overclocks a Mac. No, they don't. So what I did is I took a standard PC uh, CPU mm -hmm. cooling fan. This is the Volcano 6 from uh, Thermotake. And it's really important. What you have to find here is you have to find one that will actually 
mount to the top and sit above. Uh, you see there's a lot of different uh, right. circuitry that's uh, sticking out here. You have to find one that'll sit on mount on there correctly. And actually, the, the, clip, the clip here, that's not going to work. You've got to yank that out and find another way to kind of fasten it down to the CPU. I've seen rubber you do bands, with rubber bands, yeah. <laughs> zip ties, <laughs> any way that you can find to mount this down, uh, you know, whether it be zip ties or whatever, as long as there's a good solid connection so between the CPU. You're getting creative at that point. You are getting creative. This is where the, it comes, becomes Ordering really tricky. Ordering on sketchy. Definitely, definitely sketchy. How about RAM? RAM, uh, go to crucial.com, mm -hmm. and I would just select the Apple, and then choose the G4 configuration, okay. and it'll suggest standard PC-133 RAM. If you have some PC-133 laying around the house, you can use that as well. Uh, just go on there, and, and it's really inexpensive. You can get a 250 meg stick for like 30 bucks. Next to nothing for PC-133. Did you go with ATI or NVIDIA for graphics? Well, I could have gone with NVIDIA. I was trying to, uh, but I found a really nice ATI board that I liked that had S-Video mm -hmm. out. This, this is not the board. The board that actually I put in my system is right here. It's the Radeon 8500, which is right here. It has S-Video on the back and also has the uh, ADC connector for the Apple flat panel displays. But uh, you can go with any, uh, you actually have to go with a Mac compatible video card. You can't just go out to the PC right. store and buy your standard ATI just or your standard Just because it plugs into a PCI no. slot doesn't does not, mean it'll run in a doesn't Mac. Doesn't mean it'll work. Okay. So that you have to get, uh, you, can, you can still pick those up anywhere though. CompUSA, anywhere, ATI.com. You could yank your hard drive, your DVD, your CDRW. Any your hard PC. drive. Any, any CD-ROM, you're fine, as long as it's a standard ATA hard drive and, and, uh, and CD-ROM. I went with the Western Digital WD-800, mm -hmm. which is their special edition drive that has the 8 megs of cache. Mm -hmm. That is just an awesome hard drive. It gives us a nice little 10-15% performance increase with that extra cache, mm -hmm. and it works great on the Macs as well. So this looked like it was a nightmare to find. This is a special Macintosh power supply. Well, this is an ATX power supply. This is not the Macintosh one. The Macintosh oh. one that I actually purchased is in here. But I was going to show you the difference here. If you take a look at the connector here of a standard ATX, mm -hmm. it's a 20-pin connector. And if you'll notice here, there's two extra pins at the end that, are, that the Apple has added in there. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why they added those later. But you're not going to be able to use the standard ATX power supply. Okay. Where would you score the Mac keyboard and mouse? Now, that is the one component you can buy from Apple.com. Really? Yeah, you can go on there, and they actually sell the pro keyboards and the pro mice. And you can buy it straight from the Apple store, or you can also go to eBay if you want to save a few bucks and purchase it off there as well. And you can also get the power supply, I forgot to okay. mention, off of eBay as well. How much is the power supply? Power supply is going to uh, cost you what a standard 300-watt ATX would, you know, okay. 60, 70 bucks, somewhere around there. Sounds Nothing good. too crazy. So what do we have next? The, the Antec case is standard ATX case? This is a standard ATX case. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem that we ran into, though, is that the Apple motherboard is not an ATX motherboard. Ah. So <laughs> one thing I'll show you here is that uh, I haven't actually have another. This is a standard ATX motherboard here. Right. Now, this is a standard motherboard that you'd use with any x86 compatible PC. If you notice these, these pin, these, these holes here to, uh, to screw in screws, mm -hmm. this is standard on every single ATX case. These holes here on the motherboard are not going to align with the holes here in the case. Okay. So you're running into a big problem there. So you would actually have to pick up additional motherboard mounting screws and basically glue them or epoxy them in well, place? Or what I did is I picked up uh, one of these right here. Take mm -hmm. a look at that. And uh, I, I screwed that into the case there, into the ATX holes. And what then what is I, that if I'm shopping? I have no idea what they call it. A little actually. plastic thingy from A little from plastic thingy store. from Home Depot or something like that. Got it. Uh, you stick one of the zip ties. zip ties all the way through. And then you can actually take that through one of the holes here in the corner. So you zip tied your zip -tied motherboard, the motherboard into, the into the case. And if you look inside here, I'll show you how it's zip tied in there. There's the actual zip tie in place holding the motherboard in. Uh -huh. And you can see it working there. Now there's another option. Okay. One thing you can do is you can take this motherboard, you can hold it in the case, mm -hmm. and you can t take a little red pen like a Sharpie here. And you take the Sharpie and you stick it through and you mark all the holes and where they're at. And so that it'll actually leave marks on the case. And what you do is you take one of these here, you drill a small hole, and this is an actual tap, so you can put mm -hmm. a screw hole in there. And you tap it in there. To, I got this from Yoshi, actually. Right. He uses it all the time. Create the screw hole, and then you can actually create, so you can mount it, hard mount it to the got case it. itself. Better than using glue, better than using zip ties. We are running out of time. What happened the first time you tried to boot it? First time I had to boot it, everything went fine. Uh, it booted up just fine. Uh, basically, what you have to do is stick in OS 10.2. Hold down C, it'll boot from the CD-ROM, and uh, it'll just install just fine, and it's nice, it's, it's running great, and it's a great little machine. What are you going to do with the uh, power switch? The power switch, actually, I have a wiring diagram, so you can use a standard PC uh, power switch as well. Mm -hmm. This is just one that I found off an old Mac, and it was just that much easier just to connect it. So this is a single 
one gigahertz processor motherboard. Correct. If you built, oh, they don't even sell one gig a single CPU machine anymore. Apple doesn't know. What would happen if you built a dual CPU machine? Uh, if you, if that's going to be really tricky. You're going to have to get a bigger uh, power or a uh, bigger heatsink for it. Uh -huh. But you can do it. They do sell uh, dual processor motherboards, and you can just pick up another uh, Sonnet uh, mm -hmm. one gigahertz chip. Uh, and it would work fine. It just you really have to focus on cooling. You have to put an extra fan on top of there, and just make sure that you really keep that CPU cool because it's going to get really hot. Are you going to save any money at that point over a new G4? That's a good question. Actually, you're going to you might save a few bucks, but you're going to put a lot of time and energy into it. Uh -huh. So it all depends on how much your time's worth and whether or not you want to really tinker around with this and worry about actually how you're going to mount it. And it's a project. It's it, definitely it's a lot harder than building. This a is PC. a geeks project. This is a geeks project for sure. Okay. I Would wouldn't you, recommend it to like the basic, you know, first time computer builder. This is not your project. If you want to switch to a Mac, this is not no, the no, no, way no, no, to no. switch. Go buy an iMac or an iBook or something like that. Do not build it. But if you're a geek and you really like to geek out and get in there with the tools, this is the way to go. Would you do it again? Sure. I'd definitely do it again. It was a lot of fun. I learned a lot actually, you know, with tapping the holes and all that kind of stuff. So it, it's definitely worth trying. It's definitely worth trying. Yeah. Article up at the Screensavers? Yep, it's on there right now. Screensavers.com. This man suffered in building this computer. <laughs> you want to build your own computer, run OS X, find out where to buy the parts, how he did it. It's all up at the Screensavers.com. Good stuff. Thanks. Our first guest tonight is the professor of theoretical physics at the City University of New York and the author of phenomenal physics books such as Hyperspace, which completely changed the world for me, where he explains parallel universes, time warps, and the tenth dimension, and Visions, a book that explains how science will revolutionize the 21st century. Today we're talking about the physics of Christmas magic. Dr. Michio Kaku joins us via satellite from our bureau in New York City. Welcome, Dr. Kaku. Well, I'm glad to be on. Well, I'm a, I'm a big fan of yours. Uh, it's going to be the Mutual Admiration Society here today, sir, because uh, I have described myself as a drooling fanboy of, uh, of yours to everyone here at, at Tech TV. So this is, I'm going to do my best to keep it together and not uh, geek out too hard. Uh, it's okay. really nice to, to meet you via satellite. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so today we're talking about uh, Christmas and uh, how science views some of the great Christmas myths that have uh, uh, built up over, over the years. And for thousands of years, people have wondered about the Christmas star that supposedly pointed to Bethlehem. So what does science say? Well, astronomers can recreate the night sky of 5 BC when Jesus Christ was supposedly born, and there was nothing special about that night sky, just a conjunction of a few planets. However, a comet is perhaps the most likely candidate for the Christmas star. If a comet soars vertically north, it will linger in the night sky for weeks at a time and give the appearance of being a star shining down on Bethlehem. So these mysterious icy messengers from far beyond the solar system are in fact the leading candidate for the Christmas star. Uh, there was a guest on the screensavers yesterday who suggested that it may have been a supernova. What do you think about that? Well, if it was a supernova, we might have been fried to a crisp. Uh, the last supernovae in our neighborhood ignited about 100,000 years ago. And these are very dangerous objects because they can, in fact, wipe out entire solar systems. But the problem is, how does a star point? The only way a star can point, I think, is by having a comet's tail point in the direction of Bethlehem. One of the great myths that sprung up, of course, about uh, Christmas is the Santa Claus myth, traveling around the universe, uh, delivering gifts to the good boys and uh, good girls of the world. And, of course, his magical sleigh is propelled by reindeer. And uh, we're wondering today if reindeer can actually fly, and how could magnetism play a role in the uh, flying reindeer? Hey, well, don't laugh. It's possible. Question. Reindeers can fly, Peter Pan can fly, the Lords of the Ring can fly, Harry Potter has a broom, but with super magnets we can in fact duplicate levitation in the laboratory. Now at the present time we can actually levitate a train. These are called maglev trains. They hover just a little bit above the surface of a rail. However, in order to have flying machines that take us into, uh, into space, we really have to have room temperature superconductors, and we don't have them yet. One day, when we physicists develop room temperature superconductors, we should be able to create super magnetic fields, and at that point, unleash a second industrial revolution. What I'm really looking forward to is lots of flying cars, because people can handle the driving on the ground so well already. <laughs> 
So how could Santa Claus uh, really deliver all those, those gifts in one night? And there's this thing that I've read that said he would have to go so fast that it would actually blur him into spam uh, to get around the world in time. But you have some suggestions on how possibly he could deliver those gifts. Well, he would have to teleport himself several thousand times per second, and he would have to clone himself into hundreds of copies of himself, and he would have to have the power of telekinesis in order to scatter billions of presents almost instantly. Now, teleportation is perhaps one of the most active areas in quantum physics at the present time. We can actually teleport individual subatomic particles. A photon, for example, a particle of light, has actually been teleported in the laboratory now. But that's a far cry from teleporting Santa Claus thousands of times per second on Christmas Eve. We'll be lucky if we can teleport a few molecules within the next decade. So if I understand it correctly, the more complex the organism, the greater the possibility that when you're teleporting it and reconstructing it, you could end up with something like the, the brundlefly? That's right. There's always possibilities of tremendous quantum mistakes. Uh, at the present time, we figure that perhaps in several decades, we may be able to perhaps teleport a virus. But that's about the limit of present-day technologies where we can only teleport individual subatomic particles. Now, Santa Claus would also have to have the power of telekinesis, the ability to manipulate objects by simply thinking about it. Well, we physicists know that there are four fundamental forces. Gravity, which is attractive, the electromagnetic force, and the two nuclear forces. Unfortunately, none of these four forces are non-local. They don't allow us to manipulate objects simply by thinking about it. This means that perhaps there may be a fifth force that we haven't discovered yet, but so far we have not seen any evidence for a fifth force that may make telekinesis possible. Could we maybe say the fifth force is love? <laughs> Some people have thought that the fifth force could be psychic power, psionic power, telepathy, you name it. Uh, people have conjectured about what a fifth force can look like. Uh, maybe it's the power of screensavers. We don't know for sure. But we've looked for it. We physicists have looked very hard for a fifth force, and so far we don't see any evidence of a force which can help Santa Claus on Christmas Eve. So science is really uh, arguing against the uh, existence of Santa Claus. And I'd just like to say, Santa, if you're watching, I still believe you, and I really, really want an iPod, the big one. <laughs> and also, by the way, if you want to chat with me tomorrow night, uh, on, my, on my web address, uh, www.mkaku.org, M-K-A-K-U.org, uh, we've logged about 10 million hits so far, uh, perhaps thanks to screensavers. And tomorrow night at 9 o'clock Eastern Time, I'll be having a chat with uh, listeners. So if you want to come on my webpage, I'd be more than happy to chat with you tomorrow night at 9 o'clock Eastern Time. Well, we are out of time, so I want to thank you again, Dr. Michio Kaku, for joining us via satellite from New York City. You can read a lot more from Dr. Kaku, as he said, uh, at his website, mkaku.org, or at thescreensavers.com, where we will give you links to buy all of his fabulous books. I cannot recommend hyperspace enough. It completely changed the way that I viewed our place in the universe. It's been 238 days since we've used liquid nitrogen to overclock a CPU, and that's just way too long. So we grabbed our P4, the, the top of the line, Intel P4 3.06 gigahertz, Pentium 4, and uh, uh, a doer of liquid nitrogen, is that a measure, a doer? Yeah, I don't think it's a measure, but it's a particular type of container. Oh, that's the doer he's holding right there. Yeah. That and we're really... gonna... Now, I've got to warn everybody, before you start doing this at home, it's very important to get the protective uh, headgear. So I'm going to put that on. <laughs> Choppers! And very important to wear your protective headgear. And Patrick, by the way, is last time we didn't have the elk gloves. We now have the gloves made out of elk hide that are designed to protect them. If those will freeze solid like in three seconds, that's not going to protect I, you. These are welding gloves, but they're right. the thickest gloves we had. So liquid nitrogen is how cold? Is it 192 degrees? I think Martin knows it off the top of his head. 192 degrees, Martin? You hey, went to the, college, didn't you? the safety goggles for Mr. Laporte, please. All right. But it's, let me, it's cold, Leo. Get the safety goggles on. Yeah. Yeah, very important because uh, protective gear is everything in this business. <laughs> Do I look like Kevin Spacey? <laughs> All right, dude. Let's overclock. Rock and roll. <laughs>
No, I think I'm going to actually take this seriously. We, we, shouldn't, be, we shouldn't be frivolous with this. So it earlier, really is. Yeah, earlier this, this stuff will burn you, right? As, yeah, as cold this, as this, it is. This stuff will make your life unbelievably miserable. You could, you could actually lose a finger or an eye or Well, a the other thing it does is it will actually freeze or various any other parts of your anatomy solid. Yeah. Um, anything that protrudes burns. could actually be lost. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. So wink. don't... Don't protrude. Yeah, don't protrude. Tell you what, Leo. What, is the gummy, what does a gummy worm do? Is that a part of Well, at this point, I think we were supposed to demonstrate exactly how cold this stuff all is. All right, stick a gummy worm in liquid nitrogen and look what you get. Well, a first gummy of all, popsicle. You make the, it's, it's funny, you're watching the, uh, yeah. Solid as a rock. So this is okay. really disgusting, actually. Let's get it in. Let's stick the McDonald's baked apple pie in there. No, let's not, because somebody has to clean it up. And Leo, I know it's not going to be you. No, no. <laughs> yeah, this is now frozen. Hard as solid. a rock. Yeah. Wow. Um, they also. Can you hit it with a hammer and smash it and all that Probably, stuff? Probably, but yeah. again, last time we like had Mr. Wizard. We had a lot of lot of food Little residue. Of, yeah, that's not yeah. good. Okay. It's, uh, it's so it's boiling, upset. by the way, boiling rapidly. Let's fire it up. We actually got it up to about 150 uh, megahertz. The stock speed for this chip is like a multiplayer of 23 times 133. That okay. gives you the three. So gigas. getting to 150 is going to get that chip considerably we faster. We're actually hoping to get it up to 166. Yeah, we'll see. It, that's, this that's, is probably set pretty low. It's manual 163. All right, let's see. Can you see this? Okay, he's in the BIOS now. When you overclock, really, there's only one way these scroll, days to overclock, which is to increase the bus speed. The, scroll the, up a little bit. The chip is locked at 23x. You see where it says 163 for the external frequency. That's on that. 30 megahertz faster than normal bus, yeah. bus speed, which that's means. What is 30 divided by 133? I mean, that's the increase percentage. Yeah, obviously, you can tell that I Martin, you went to college. What is that? <laughs> what is. What? Huh? <laughs> Martin really doesn't pay attention during he the He actually show. went to Hamburger U. It's not the same. <laughs> right. Actually, he's a graduate of a very prestigious university. Who's fast with math? 30 divided by 133. Four. Four. It's That's a 40% a increase. I don't think it's quite that much, but it's <clears> close. <throat> okay. It's close. We were hoping to hit 4 gigahertz. We're not going to hit 4 gigahertz. We were is it running? Is it, so this is it's, it's running. running. It's booting. It's going to get well over 3. Let's see. Hardware monitor found an error. It's because it doesn't see a, a floppy drive. Oh, okay. That's not important. Start windows normally. 0 0.22. 0 0.22. 0 0.22. Thank you. Paul Block, who went to college. Ken Marcus. Ken Marcus. It's actually his job on the show. Many people don't know. Doing math? <laughs> yeah, he's the mathematician. So all the way from that to boot statistician. Up. We've got basically the big styrofoam cup here. We're using that it's as a booting. Ball. Inside of this, yeah, basically. You son of a gun. So it's 22%. It's it crashed. It crashed. Yeah, so this is the fun. Like, Yoshi and I have been doing this. And then you remember something. Yoshi's on the side, like, going, show the megahertz speed. You can do it. You can do it. <laughs> and, you know, and 37.95 so was the fastest we saw for a few 37, seconds. 37.95, which would be 3.79 So you can gigahertz. see this. Wow. Let's get a shot of that again. Basically, what we have is a copper tube, a large copper plate. Why we is... took off a heat sink. We use that. We basically use that. And we've insulated it to try to keep. We have so much. If With we leave what, the bare friction copper, tape? Um, we actually have. Uh, Styrofoam underneath that. Okay. But what happened though is we were finding that if you don't, if you look down, you've seen a huge amount of frost. This is a lot less than we were getting earlier. That's moisture. That's yeah. condensation. That's bad. That's bad. That's bad. Computers don't like moisture. moisture. In case you didn't know. I knew that. Yeah. He's a good start. I so didn't go to college. <laughs> so uh, why? Better explain to me. What is nitrogen or cooling it like this have to do with the overclocking? Speed? Well, overclocking, right? One of the biggest problems with overclocking is your CPU getting too hot. So we're trying to eliminate CPU temperatures. It's definitely not getting too hot. Here's the problem. Yeah, it's, it'll be interesting to see what the Might, temperature looks like. Could it get too cold? It probably. We could you freeze the electrons? We're convinced we've actually frozen them. When we were playing around last year, um, we got it to some ridiculously low temperatures, and we managed to seize up almost the entire board. So, so you think 163 is a little too high? So we're going to go to 162. 162. Oh, you know what else is? We need to. Sometimes you bump the voltage when you're overclocking. That was our problem. That gives you a little more reliability, right? All right. Let's exit and save. Okay. Save configuration. This is an stuff. Asus motherboard, which they are very nice. They have this soft BIOS that allows you to overclock very easily yeah. in the BIOS. They make some nice motherboards. They're, they're good stuff. So we're going to watch this. We're going to watch this restart real quick. Here's we the thing, talked though. yesterday about steppings of the Athlon. Mm -hmm. is, is that true also of Pentium chips that uh, some are easier to overclock? You can say that almost any, like, you know, the, this particular stepping worked great. It's almost like saying a Monday versus a Friday car. You know, the April Fords were the bomb. <laughs> yeah, you know right, what I mean? Right, it's a lot right. of it, it. They seem yeah, to vary, I think, more per batch than they do over time, although some people will argue about that. 
But some particular speeds have just found the, we found that are just more amenable to overclocking. Is it enough to say it worked if you went boot into Windows, or is no. there no? Because that's, no, that's wanna, not you want to boot into Windows and you want to do stuff with it. You know, the the mere fact that you actually got it to launch is not right. much, but you want to actually launch it and run tests. It was ironic. We had we were able to overclock a machine 50 percent some years ago, and mm -hmm. one ran Quake 3 great. But it couldn't run Windows very well. So it's just, you know, you just got to... It, a little it bizarre. Crashed. Didn't do it. It Didn't crashed. Didn't do it? Oh, well. oh, wait a minute. No, it rebooted no, it itself. Crashed. It rebooted. It's about 160 was the most we could get out of this. The other issues, you've got the AGP bus, the PCI bus, the memory. All of that works together. And if they don't work properly... And overclocking is going to pretty much stress everything out you, on You're that. moving this video card 20% you know, faster right. as well. You're moving the memory 20% faster as What's well. What's nice is some of the newest motherboards will actually allow you to separate the PCI bus and the AGP bus from the front side bus speed, which gets a little interesting. In theory, it should make it a touch easier. I'm getting the, the voice. Oh, here we go. CPU clock. And I'm just going to have a little 3724. Yes! Yes, so. baby! To 3.72 gigahertz. And we're going to keep playing around with this in the background, see if we can get it up. And to you got, you said Yoshi to 3.79, you guys, earlier today? Well, we'll see, we'll see how high we can get. 39. But it didn't, not stable. The not happiness will continue. For more information yeah. on overclocking with the element with an atomic mass of 14.007, huh? Go to thescreensavers.com. Don't you think, I think stability is a little overrated? Oh. Yeah. Back over here with the ultimate entertainment system to see Yoshi's brand new MP3 jukebox in action. This is Project Orpheus. Explain again what this MP3 jukebox does for us. Basically, it's a computer. Like any other computer, you can make these controls on any PC. So you don't have to build your own box. You can do this with your home PC. Um, I've used a WinApp plugin called BrowseAmp to enable me to control WinApp through a web page, which I'm controlling with a Wi-Fi enabled pocket PC. Let me hold that so people can actually see. So if we go down here, see, so select your songs. You can hear in the background now. Just change the song that's playing on the radio. Oh. To a little Al Green. You know, you got to go with Al Green. Right. And switch to. ATC there. <laughs> so you're using, you installed Winamp. and I installed can anyone, Winamp. Is it just, does it come I, for the Pocket PC? No, no, it doesn't come for the Pocket PC. Um, I also, a note, I had to use Winamp 2.81. Uh, the BrowseAmp plugin, I could not get to work with Winamp 3. Okay. Which I, you know, I like Winamp 3, so I was trying to get to work with that, but I could not. Um, what you have to do, and I got it, I got it up here, um, BrowseAmp, if you go in here to the configuration page, allows you to choose your own skins. So I have a few that I've made here, Pocket PC2, Pocket PC3, just to do my tests. I took their base their base skin and I just scaled everything down for a Pocket PC screen. Oh. So I went to like 308 by 168 or something thereabouts in terms of screen resolution. Um, you can do anything you want. You can make a flash interface. You can just have all kinds of cool graphics if you're going to control it via the computers in your house. So you customized Winamp for the Pocket PC. You did that all on your own? Well, I, I customized their interface on my own. Okay. I didn't make the whole interface. <laughs> Give okay. credit where credit's due. I just okay. customized the interface. And the interface, the way he provides it, it's meant for you to customize. He tells you, hey, make your own interface, do whatever you want. Okay. So what, what are you running this on? Is it Windows, Linux, Mac? It's, it's Windows. I wanted to run Linux, but uh, unfortunately the sound card I used does not have a Linux driver. Mm, was so the, that was my big problem. bottleneck was just that one driver right there. So I'm running it on Windows XP, um, which has all the drivers, has the Winamp support. Made a, that's why I chose Winamp. Right. Otherwise I would have gone with some other solutions. Right. So if you had a, um, a sound card that would run on Linux that did have a driver, what would be the advantages of doing that? A little smaller operating system, more stable. It's, it's really about, I mean, this is not going to be used as a computer. So right. I don't really care if it can browse the Internet, if I can check email with it. I just want to play music out of it. So the, the Linux kernel is just a little nicer for that because it's simpler. Right. So you've got Winamp, you've got BrowseAmp, the plug, plug in. Then how do you get your music onto the jukebox? Well, it's attached to network cable. Oh. So I can share a folder on here, drag and drop them from my other computers. I can go to the interface here. This is the interface here for the program. So uh -huh. that's on this. Oops. I think I hit the power button. Whoops. <laughs> that was the interface. <laughs> that for was the, the interface for the program. Um, but I have it connected to the TV. You can connect it to a monitor. It still has all that same functionality. So you can go on, load your DVDs in here, your CDs in there, rip your current CDs that you own. Right. <laughs> and right. make sure everything's on there. Nice, high, high quality, 320 bit rate. Uh, there's plenty of room in there to add second, third, fourth hard drive if that's what I choose to do also. Right. So how many MP3s? How much can you store on this? This is. This one is just 120 gigs, okay. so, you know, a few thousand. <laughs> okay, so you got your whole project, Orpheus. If you were going to start over, was there anything you'd change about the way you did this project? 
Um, yeah, I'd really like to use the laser cutter to cut all this stuff out. <laughs> that was a cool laser cutter. That was very cool. I want one of those for myself. So you customized the whole HTML interface on that pocket mm -hmm. PC there. That is very cool. That was, that was actually surprisingly easy. easy. It was the first thing I've ever done in HTML. I mean, really? you're the HTML person. <laughs> I just used Dreamweaver, brought it up. It was pretty easy. To, oh, okay, I just need to change this, this. And it took yeah. me about 20 minutes to do the whole fun. thing. And this was all you, you just thought this up on your own? Mm -hmm. wow. Well, I figured, you know, I was going to do this, and then I got to thinking, I'm like, well, I want a remote control, but I already have a pocket PC. I might as well make that my remote control. Right. So you got a little 802.11 card in there? Yeah, I got an Orinoco 802.11B. Nice. Well, that is very cool. So if we wanted to do this... Would we be able to go to screensavers.com and you would be able find to go to the screensavers.com and find all the instructions? Unfortunately, I had a little accident, and I'll tell people right now, all uh -oh. my pictures accidentally got formatted on my flashcard. Uh -oh. I thought I had downloaded them already, so I'm gonna have to go back and retake all my photos and post them again later. Right. Well, maybe you know they'll be worth more now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is our all mod show, so it seems fitting to start off with a mod. Why not? Yes, let's take a look at what Yoshi has cooked up for us. The only the first thing you've cooked up for us today. What is this? Well, essentially, this is a computer. Okay. Um, this is an MP3 <laughs> player. I decided, you know, I got a little sick of playing all my MP3s through my desktop system. Mm -hmm. It looks ugly. It doesn't go on a piece, you know, stereo rack. Why not build something that's meant to go exactly. on a stereo rack? So, you know, I like that, that wood side. You know, it's a little, little retro, but mm -hmm. I like the, the yeah, wood incorporated 70s. sides, it's you know. smooth. <laughs> well, it's, you know, nice walnut. Yes. Got to use a good wood. <laughs> and essentially what's inside is uh, I have a Via Epia Mini ITX uh, motherboard, a little 800 megahertz motherboard, 170 mm -hmm. millimeter square, nice small footprint. Um, I got an M Audio sound card, real nice studio quality sound card. How much would this sound card? Be the sound about? card runs about three hundred dollars. Right. This is the most expensive part in the entire system. Okay, so you didn't just yank this out of one of our PCs? <laughs> no, no, no. We purchased this specifically for this. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, what else we got in here? Power supply that's a little modded open. This isn't meant to be open because you could touch it and shock yourself. Right. So that meant to be closed. Mm -hmm. um, slot loading DVD drive, so I can have this the nice slot in the front there. Nice. Um, Western Digital Special Edition 120 gigabyte hard drive, Ooh. nice 8 megabyte buffer, and of course you got to know what's playing, so a matrix orbital VFD display. Right. And uh, this nice little power mate up here, it was working when I tested it on the laptop, but mm -hmm. it's not working now. Oh. <laughs> and that's supposed to change your system volume, cycle through playlists, if you don't want to use the uh, pocket PC interface that I'm going to be showing you how to use. Ooh. All right. Well, how did you decide on this design? I like the top there. Did you dremel those holes in there? No. I I've had bad luck dremeling plastic. I tend to break it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I got a drill press for this, laid it all out, did it, and it just comes out nice and clean if you use a drill press. That's, yeah, that's pretty. And the design itself, I use, uh, I got a piece of cardboard, basically. I'm like, okay, I know it needs to be 17 inches wide because that's a standard width for a stereo system and pretty much a standard 14 for the depth. Right. And I just cut out a 17 by 14 block, laid all my components out so I can figure out how everything is going to work space-wise. Because mm -hmm. if you just go start, you can measure it and do it in theory, but it just doesn't work all the time. Right. So I wanted to make sure it worked in practicality. Practically. So smart design. Okay, what are your tips for viewers planning to do this on their own? The biggest tip is start with the mock-up, like in cardboard, something like that. Okay. Um, my brackets, I, I just bought little uh, business card, like card holders from like a plastic supply store uh -huh. and cut those up to make brackets rather oh. than having to buy special plastic, bend it, or get metal and bend it to make brackets. Um, the biggest tip is be, improvise. Find things that you can cut up to make the parts you need rather than trying to specially make them or special order specific parts that are a lot more expensive. Yeah. Speaking of expensive, how much did this all cost? All total in about $600. Hmm, that's not bad. No, not at all. And uh, could you cut the price down? You were talking a little bit about buying different parts. Um, I could cut the price down a little bit. I mean, the, the VFD display pushed the price up a little bit just because mm -hmm. that's... It's not really a function. That's just more for form. Right. So you could get rid of that if you don't need that. You right. could get but rid of this power. But that's for showing off when you have people well, over. Well, of course. You want it to look nice. <laughs> exactly. You know? It's got to look nice. Exactly. <laughs> How long did it take you to create this whole? All total, it took me probably about 20 hours to build. Not bad. It's not too bad not at all. Not bad. Mostly in the middle of the night, I can bet. Yeah. I, I tend to do a lot of work in the wee hours of the morning. <laughs> yes. That's when you work best. All right. Well, what was your inspiration for this project? My inspiration is I, I wanted to listen to music and I didn't want to have to touch anything, to walk up to anything, go to the computer screen, go to the, uh, com the player itself to change songs. I want to control all my songs. It's like, this is a small example. Every Smashing Pumpkin CD. 
I have hundreds of CDs. I don't have time to change them. Right. <laughs> well, we'll learn about how you can wirelessly do that in a little bit. But go to the screensavers.com for the parts list and tips for building your own. We're going to have a, another mod, but then we'll come back, look at Project Orpheus again, see how it all hooked up, and talk software. So stick around to find out. What makes this beast run? <laughs> so I, I hear a lot of chatter about women in science and technology. So I am taking on five common myths about us ladies over here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so myth one. Ready. Ready. Mm -hmm. um, women are right-brained. Technology is a left-brained field. Not true. I don't think that's true. It also boils down to things when people say things like, well, women just aren't biologically less interested in science and technology, or their brains aren't as logical as men's brains are. And I did a little bit of research, and I found on the internet, I found studies that proclaimed women both more logical and less logical than men. So my conclusion, of course, <laughs> is that these data is not necessarily conclusive, and people can interpret them in different ways, depending on sort of their points of view and what they're, what they're interested in. Um, now, see, if we accept, I think the theory is if we accept the underrepresentation of women in these industries and blame it on differences in biology, this kind of thing, then I think that we're less likely to support um, you know, some programs that are going to help women get into technology. Right, yeah, it's just a self-perpetuating problem, I guess. Exactly. All right, yeah. Myth number two. I'm ready. M women have lives. <laughs> <laughs> and this is true. It does take a lot of dedication to program for eight hours a day, add blue LEDs to your case fan for two hours over a large meat lover's pizza, <laughs> and then get in the bare minimum four-hour maintenance session of EverQuest. Yes. I agree. This takes some time, and then doze off to the flickering lights of Star Trek Voyager in syndication. Yeah, you just busted the myths because everyone out there thinks that you do have this life, but really, that it is. there it is, <laughs> you at home playing no, with no, your no. and docs. But I think this is true. <laughs> I think that women do have lives, but I also oh. think that men have lives. A lot of our screensavers, male audience, they get up in the morning, they shower, they go to work, they have lunch with their coworkers, they come home to their wives, they pick up their kids from T-ball. And when they talk about exploits, they're not necessarily talking about computers. Mm. So I think <laughs> that men, both men and women, have lives, right. is my point here. Mm -hmm. And just because women have lives doesn't mean they cannot be interested in technology. All right. Myth number three, women don't like gadgets. That's now, just to begin, you and I both know plenty of men who don't know what SCSI stands for and exactly. aren't aware of the horrifying limitations of integrated video. It's awful. It really is. Okay, as for gadgets, sometimes women and men too realize that a $40 bright green inflatable speakers <laughs> might just be more gimmicky than useful. Exactly. Aren't they just no. the cutest things? Yes. Martin would like that. He probably yeah. would. <laughs> now, if it is useful, and, you know, so I think sometimes guys get really excited to like grab it from people's, from women's hands and mm -hmm. show them how it works. Yeah. But sometimes it's better to just let someone enjoy the gadget and like exactly. kind of get to know it and then they can integrate it more easily into their own lives. Right. And I think that's the easiest way to, you know, get women interested in gadgets if the woman in your life isn't interested. Right. Yeah. Pretty cool. Myth number four. Women did not help build the tech industry. Now I have some links on the screensavers.com to read about lots of women who helped build the science and technology industry. But today I want to tell you about the first computer programmers. Women. Women, <laughs> six women, first computer programmers. The ENIAC was the first electronic general purpose computer built to calculate ballistic trajectories during World War II. Now, these complex differentials had been made by a group of 80 female mathematicians. Now, these women were called computers. <laughs> when the ENIAC was built, it needed to be programmed, and who came to the call to program it with the same uh, formulas that they used? Six women, women, Marilyn Meltzer, Ruth Tietelbaum, Frances Spencer, Kay Antonelli, Jean Bardick, and Benny, Betty Holberton, who is also known for her work on COBOL. Mm -hmm. These women were the first computer programmers in the world. Okay, myth number five. I'm dying for this one. <laughs> there are not many women in the tech industry, and this is true. It is true. It is true. There are not as many women in the tech industry as there should be. Um, only about 9% of engineers and 20%, 6% of computer scientists are women. And our numbers who are graduating with computer science degrees used to be about 37% in 1984. Now it's down to 20%. Really? So it's going down? It's going down. down Girls! Down, down. Girls out there! I put lots of goodies <laughs> at screensavers.com I have an, my, with my article. And there's a talk back, so feel free to put your two cents in. Everybody has two cents on this they issue. Do. And so I want to know what everyone would think about this. I also have statistics, links, and references to everything I've talked about here Excellent. today. Yes. Wow. Thank you so much. That's yes. very cool. Yes. Food for thought. Yes. Well, as you all know by now, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting. And naturally, I'm curious about what's going on. Wait a minute. I think you're supposed to read this, Megan. <laughs> I think so.
<laughs> so about true. what's going on in my belly? No, her <laughs> belly. Actually, we got a couple of uh, pregnant women mm -hmm. here. Yeah, we found this pregnant woman on the street. Gina is one of our directors. Actually, we got to say, Tech TV is one of the most fertile places I've ever seen because Taylor's pregnant, Gina's pregnant, Megan's pregnant, Andrew's wife's having a baby in a week. Anybody else want to share? Yeah. Who's? Yeah, Roman's Roman. wife. Yeah, Christina. The woman from LucasArts. Everybody's pregnant. You just walk in the door. It's in the water, I it's guess. It's in the water. Yeah. So, this is something that I did not, we did not have when Jennifer and I had our kids, but it's really kind of neat. You can yes. listen to your baby. Yes, these are prenatal listening devices. They're also called fetal monitoring devices or fetal dopplers. Okay, now you go to the, we went to the hospital and mm -hmm. do that. Yes, every right? time you go, you And you hear the heartbeat. You, yeah, they, they stick some on you and it's like, right. oh, that's the okay. main, most amazing thing. Is this an ultrasound or is it a little? It is, no, it's Doppler, te this is not Doppler technology. Okay. An ultra, so you're not going to see any visuals. Okay. But this You're is just hear sounds. Your baby. Yes, just sounds. Mama. Yeah. Mama. <laughs> no, no talking no, yet. No, talking. no let's, let's, except for the really smart babies. What do doctors but, say about the, using doctors this? Doctors really, they're, they're not thrilled about these because they're hard, especially the cheaper ones, are hard to find the heartbeat. And right. so, of course, when you can't find the heartbeat, you freak out, you call right. up and say, ah, right. you're going to be Are they there. dangerous in any way? No, they're not. Okay. No. It's just I harmless mean, to use. You know, there's, sci there's always scientific you know, investigation going right. on about ultrasound technology and all this technology. You should always ask your doctor before you use any of these. I asked my doctor, she's like, fine, and I asked her all these questions. I was like, is it, am I poking the baby? Am right. I hurting the baby? Is the baby like, going, no, oh, it's so loud. It's so loud in here. So, I mean, the baby can definitely tell what's going on, but not, not being hurt. Is this, this is the this womb is song. This is the womb That's not song. A, okay, what does that do? This is, you can listen, but you can also play. Like so, Mozart to the baby? Yes, you can play. And it actually comes with a Mozart CD. <laughs> 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 so, isn't that nice? So, let me um, put this on under here and see if you can hear anything. Um, it's, let's see, can we hear, is it on? Now, this is kind of, and this is something we should underscore, it's a little tricky to do. Yeah, it is hard to Oh, do. I guess I have to turn it on. So, it's best to um, not freak out if you don't hear something. Right. Did you, do you have, you don't, did, I Gina, have did you get, have one of these. You do have one we of these. We have one of those, and we play music to the baby every night for 10 minutes. Baby yeah. sounds. He likes this Vivaldi. That's his favorite. Baby sounds. Oh, I love Vivaldi, yeah, too. That's yeah, that's Baroque music, I think children really enjoy. And you uh, talk this, to him, too. And we you? talk to him, too. My yeah. husband puts the, the little... microphone? Yeah, he's all, hi, this is Daddy. <laughs> baby thinks Daddy's Darth Vader, right? Exactly. <laughs> I am your father, son. Exactly. That's no, it. I don't know Are we hearing hear anything, anything at all? Are we hearing any... Ray? Or, we or, recorded that oh, just because we knew this is difficult. There, no. I think that's my lunch. I think lunch. it's the burrito you have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it definitely is. We recorded some stuff ahead of yeah, time, right? Yeah, we did. We did. We just because we hear knew. You, this, we actually record. We didn't record these. Um, we could. Should we listen to this one? Listen, or is the, it this, we, this, or the, this is this your is baby? This is what it sounds like. Whose baby is this? Gina's baby? Yes. Megan's baby. Megan's baby. Megan's baby. I can't tell. Do you hear it a little bit? I heard it earlier. There's a, it's like a whooshing yeah. heartbeat. I think we had Gina's, because you're a month well, ahead I, of yeah, me. Yeah, so. I'm about 24 weeks, so I'm a little farther And off. it shows yeah. the beats per minute, too, right? Yeah, it shows. Mm -hmm. And what's normal, for like a, like faster than it's a It's usually between it. 140 and 160. Yeah. It's pretty fast. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really fast. She's having a boy and I'm having a girl, so it's different. Oh, really? So this is fun if you don't know yet. Here's a boy. Yes. This is what a boy's heartbeat sounds like. <laughs> You know, it's funny. You play that backwards, it says Morgan is hot. <laughs> I don't, you know, I just... <laughs> hey, it's a boy. And by the way, Morgan's pregnant, too. Morgan, oh, no. No, no. no. She is no, not. She's not. Let's not start any rumors. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> now, you were listening there to... Can we, are we this is the baby this reel? This is the baby beat Doppler oh, baby with the display. So, Which one I'm, should I bring to uh, Kelly? Because one of these Kelly's going to... <laughs> one of these Kelly's going to... Patrick just hit me. One of these Kelly's is going to well, play Well, I don't with. know. See, this, this is four. This, this one's $625. Oh, ow. But you can rent it, right? Yeah, you can rent it for $50 a month. This is the serious technology. That's the best here. one? Yeah. Well, this is the one because it also well, shows. It. Okay. You want to try it? <laughs> so put, do I have well, to put need, a little of the yeah, glue on? You, yeah, you need the... With these, don't use any gel because it'll ruin the microphone. With these, you can use some gel. Okay, yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> I hear a baby. <laughs> we might be able to hear your heartbeat. <laughs> oh, wow, okay. 
Okay, I, I think that this was never intended to be done on a man. <laughs> no, no. But sometimes that's one thing you should be careful about because sometimes you can hear your own heartbeat, and so don't worry if it's much slower because right. that's just your heartbeat. Gina, you want to try? Is this a kind of you have this? But is, uh, would you like to hear the baby's heartbeat every night? I mean, is this the kind yeah, of thing you'd like? Actually, it would be great. With that one, the only thing is we've only heard it once, so it's like you really it's have hard. to it has to be the perfect situation. The baby has to be in the right position. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. And, you know, every night I try, you know, sometimes 10 minutes, but I can't hear it. It kind of worries me. But then I play the music and it starts kicking. I'm like, okay, everything's okay. Yeah. But <laughs> it's nice to have that security to know that he's neat. okay. Yeah. We, we did kick counts and stuff, and you see the kicking and things right. like that. Yeah. But what are you laughing at? We did. We counted the kicks. The first child. The second child, we didn't really care. It's like, just get out of there. Yeah. We're going to have a baby. Gina Simmons is one of the directors, one of the great directors here at yes. Tech TV. Does call Tech Live help. and Call for Help. Mm -hmm. And occasionally does our show. Mm -hmm. We love having you over here. And I love when doing are you it? do? Uh, February 24th. Congratulations and Thank good you. luck. You're having a boy. Megan, as we know, mm -hmm. is having a girl. And Morgan is having uh, turkey <laughs> tetrazzini for dinner. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> Read more about what Megan thinks about all these devices at thescreensavers.com. Thanks, Morgan. We are outside with Pete's war driving rig, which it turns out is just a standard old Saturn with some high-tech tools. Let's take a look at those. Yeah, we try to choose the uh, a car that doesn't stand out too much. Um, <laughs> Good point. So um, what I'm doing is simply set up. Uh, normally, when you use a wireless LAN, you use the, the antenna that's built into the card. For example, uh, this. But inside of a car being made out of metal, the radio reception inside the card is actually somewhat restricted. Ah. So what we do here, we want to see what's going on. Um, we have about uh, five networks actually standing right here, none of which are from CNET or Tech TV. <laughs> Thank goodness. Uh, yep. Like, <laughs> and uh, we have here is a standard GPS. All right. So we we'll sit here and uh, and what we do is we simply set all this up inside the car. Normally, this does not need human interaction. It's actually uh, we set this up so it does not need it. The software we run is um, software called NetStumbler. Okay, and that's I, not the one you wrote, right? Yeah, I wrote something called uh, WL Scan about a year and a half ago. On BSD. Free yeah, BSD. Under, runs under FreeBSD. And uh, somebody basically saw what I've done and said, this is a great idea. Um, did a better job than me under Windows, so actually I use their software now. That's what free software is about. <laughs> so for here, we simply connect, in this case, we simply connect up an external antenna. And actually by connecting the external antenna, I automatically cocked up three more wireless LANs in the area. Wow. So we've already quite significantly extended our range. Uh, the next step is we take a GPS antenna. Uh, normally a GPS doesn't need an external antenna, but when you're driving in cities, for example, uh, the reception gets somewhat blocked by the various buildings. So the antenna helps a lot. And this way you can keep a very strong uh, link on exactly where you are. Okay. And this allows your maps to be a little bit more accurate since you can get, get within six meters with this right. if you're lucky on a nice day. So do you, when you're doing this, do you have to actually hang out of the window or can oh, no. you do it from inside the car? Uh, we've got literally just um, run it like this. Take a second or two of plugging in here. All right. Plug the GPS in. Normally we do this inside the car with a dozen donuts. <laughs> um, donuts. This is a Krispy Kreme. Mm. <laughs> We usually pre-untangle these things. Right, yes. You probably have a little untangling assistant. So what are you do, doing there? You're hooking the yeah. GPS up to the computer? Right, we're waiting for the GPS. We'll have a, uh, should have a link to satellites in a second. Excellent. Then this simply plugs into the screen. And once we establish a strong wireless link, which we will in about two seconds. I hope no one who uh, is working around here is watching this right now. <laughs> and we're quite literally ready to go. All right. Um, we can, this is Velcro on the back, so we can literally slap this right onto the dashboard. Excellent. Um, this can go under your seat or, on, or on your lap if you want some video entertainment. Um, I don't <laughs> recommend uh, watching the screen while driving. <laughs> yeah. That's a good, uh, good safety precaution. Yeah, I do. Although, um, and then oh, if you have a friend with you, they can basically read in. You can actually turn this on so it beeps. Uh, one little story, as I was driving around, when I first did this, I actually had to have the laptop open. I was actually writing code, pulling over, fixing the code, <laughs> driving. And I, I pulled over on First Street at about 4 in the morning. And, we're going, and a policeman pulled in right behind me. 
And I was like, you know, uh-oh, how am I going to explain this one here? <laughs> I, was, I was right in front of uh, 3Com, nice uh-huh. strong connection. So I grabbed the water bottle, dumped it on my chest, and by the time the police had walked up, he goes, why'd you pull over here? He says, I was drinking some water, it spilled on my chest, and, and, and I didn't want to get into an accident, so I pulled over so I can clean myself up safely. And he's like, and he's Good for you for being safe. Uh, next time, pull into a parking lot. I'm like, thank you, officer. Yes. Yeah, you heard it here first. Never code while drive, while driving. Yes. All right, we got everything at thescreensavers.com. If you've missed anything of, about what Pete's done today, go to our website. Our first guest is a security consultant and is well known and respected in the hacker community. He's the founder of dis.org, a group of professional engineers and computer specialists who work together on eclectic projects. This is Pete Shipley. He's also considered the pioneer of war driving. And he's about to tell us about it. It's good to see you. You came on the show a few years ago, right? Yes, and it's fun to be back. Yes, well, thanks for having me. It's very cool to have someone from dis.org here. We've known about you guys for a while and love it. Used to have a little dis.org t-shirt that Patrick brought me back from DEFCON. Send a replacement. Yes, that's what you said. I wanted you to say it on TV so everyone else could hear you say it. So let's, let's, what is war driving? Let's start Um, there. War driving is the mapping of open wireless networks. Um, About uh, two years ago, a year and a half ago, I realized that as wireless networks are more prevalent, that possible security concern. And after walking around, I realized, well, there there are problems. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to walk areas, and in addition, I wanted to write a paper on this, and the only way to write a paper is to cover a large area. Right. So I outfitted the car. Now, before me, people have, I'm not the first person to actually run around in a car mapping networks. Mm-hmm. Uh, people have done it before me with a laptop and a piece of pad of paper and a bunch of guys and 12 donuts running around. Um, I was the first person to completely automate it. With what I did is when I got a GPS, I wrote some software that connects the, my GPS to my computer. Mm-hmm. My laptop ran FreeBSD. I wrote some scripts in Perl that would communicate with the wireless card and when I found a new network, would ask the GPS where we were, and I'd create a log file. And eventually I'd generate these quite verbose log files, and I wrote programs to generate maps of this right. so you could visualize the data. Yeah. And it's shown that I have maps dating back uh, about a year and a half now. And we've actually seen wireless networking get more and more dense in various areas because uh, security has changed. Right. Uh, but a year and a half ago, only 15% of networks actually use encryption. Now up to 30% use it. Mm-hmm. Not enough. To but they're getting there. Right. So you're in the Bay Area. Tell us about your work in Berkeley. Um, well, what, I did, what I've done is, well, since I live in Berkeley, one of the first cities actually detailed maps of was Berkeley in downtown mm-hmm. San Francisco. This way we have residential and we have uh, business. So we got uh, a map here. Yeah, on the screen is a uh, map of Berkeley. Uh, the red pins are people's home wireless networks that have utterly no security. Wow. Encryption. In fact, they're running in default mode, which means they got the device, took it out of the box, plugged it in, didn't even change the configuration settings. Probably didn't even change the administrator password. Wow. Um, the R- That's amazing. Yeah, the yellow oranges pins are people with um, no encryption but have done some changes. And the green pins are people actually use encryption. Right. So let's, let's see the map of San Francisco also. There, there's a little bit of difference, I think. Yeah, the San Francisco map Whoa. was made to show the density of the area. Obviously, uh, the areas that don't have any networks on it are areas that just didn't bother driving. It concentrated the business district that day. And these are names of various networks, and uh, might be hard to read on TV, but you could. But these maps actually have, um, you know, various well-known corporations, banks, mm-hmm. uh, legal firms, and such. And these people have wide open networks, and every every name on this is an open network. Right. If you stand in downtown San Francisco, for example, if you stand on uh, Fremont Market Street, uh, basically ground zero of the financial district, and just turn on your laptop without any special equipment, you'll have eight separate corporation networks to connect mm-hmm. to and have internet access. Wow. That is, so what kind of equipment do you have? I see you have this very cool vest here that has a lot of technology in it. What, what's going on here? Uh, well, traditionally we use a car, which we'll talk about later, but um, it's been nice summer days recently, and I figured, well, I don't like driving around all the time, <laughs> so why don't I bicycle? So I dug out one of my tech vests, and I wow. simply outfitted it uh, with my GPS. Wow, here. very cool. Uh, in the shoulder, I attached a uh, GPS antenna for better reception. Uh-huh. This would have a very strong link. And in the rear, I basically have a uh, disposable computer, basically. Um, instead of putting a, one of my reasonable laptops, I went to eBay, picked up a nice $200 computer. Nice. This way, if you fall off your bike, I'm not going to get too upset. Yeah. And this is everything you need. Wow. Uh, another advantage I've discovered about this is if I wear a coat over it, I can literally walk into buildings, uh, financial centers, and they don't look twice, mm-hmm. and you get more detailed maps. Okay, that brings me to a question. You're not doing this. I assume you're not doing this so that you can make money off it and then steal, or else you probably wouldn't be telling us this on television. No. What's the reason you're doing this? The reason I did it, I'm a security evangelist. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times, you tell, I've learned over the years, after about 15 years on the Internet, they warn people about security problems or they ignore you. 
Right. But if you could prove demographically and statistically the problem exists, they'll li more, more likely listen. Mm -hmm. So what I've done was I've actually, all my war driving, I've actually kept strong demographic data. Uh, everything I use in my research and the papers I've coming up is data that I've gathered right. and researched and refined. And this is so I could write, basically write papers and prove to the security community that, that this is a problem. Right. So you have to be secretive at first to get in there to be able to prove it. And then, then Not that's why you wear I mean, the vest and the, the trench coat so people don't know that you're... Well, if I was to walk into a office building like this, they'll tell you some of the package deliveries are in the rear. Right. That's, yeah. <laughs> they probably would have some questions. All right. Stay tuned, everyone. Coming back next, we haven't gotten rid of Pete yet. We're heading outside to take a look at how simple it is to set up a war driving rig. The time has finally arrived. You've never seen anything like it anywhere on Earth. What's under this cloth is the most powerful gaming system ever built. Is there an echo in here? It's six times as powerful as any Uggum we've ever attempted to build. Women and children scream in terror at its sheer unadulterated magnitude. It plays computer games, PlayStation 2 games, Xbox games, GameCube games, Nintendo games, Atari games, the games people play. Ladies and gentlemen, the screensavers presents the pinnacle of video gaming systems. Yoshi's Box! Everybody, let's all gather around Yoshi's Box. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen, the man who made Yoshi's Box what it is today, Yoshi. <laughs> That's why we call it Yoshi's Box. <laughs> what is this? Um, a lot of time <laughs> on my hands. At one point, you were up 100 hours straight. You yeah. got four hours sleep in 100 hours yeah. getting this thing together. <laughs> Tell us what is so special about Yoshi's Box. Uh, well, we kind of got the crazy idea in our head that we would take a PC and an Xbox and a GameCube and put it together, and then we thought, well, let's add a PS2 and an Atari and a Nintendo, too. So how many game systems are in here? Six, including the PC. Uh, and you've got front panels for each so that you can actually yes. get access to it. Let me take off the yeah. side. Customized. We're talking heavy Dremel tool use here. <laughs> inside, there's Yoshi's box. Give us a little tour of what's inside. Well, if we kind of swing around a little bit here. Yeah, you're going to swing yourself around and then, uh, yeah. We have the standard PC layout. All right, which, you got you PC know, in there. It's a pretty good gaming system. Oh, yeah, it's an uh, Athlon XP2100. We got uh, PC2700 RAM. What kind of video card in there? Right now we have an ATI all in wonder because I was trying to run the Atari through that. You, need a, you needed a TV out card. Yeah, but I ran into a little problem. It doesn't want to really run the TV through the card for some reason, or the Atari through the So maybe the we'll put TV. a better, like a GeForce 4 in there. I'm going to put a GeForce 4 in there, right. and I'm going to... Do a little hack on the Atari and make it just how did you get it out? Now where's the Xbox stuff? Well, the Xbox motherboard is up here. So you actually took the motherboard so out of the case. Up here. All right. And the power supply is attached to the roof up here. Let's tilt it back <laughs> so we get some light there. So that fan on the top up there, on the that's top the Xbox. Here. Up a little higher. There it all is. All the way up there. That, what's that there? <laughs> that's the power supply for the Xbox. Xbox up power there. supply. Oh man, <laughs> a lot of custom machine work in here. That's yeah. the Xbox. Not, what's next? Um, well, what's next? The GameCube is up here in our top drive bay. Okay. Um, had to actually take a belt sander to the side of that to get it to fit properly because it was about <laughs> two millimeters too just, wide. So you just sanded it down. I just a sanded bit. it down and stuck it right in. Um, our PlayStation 2 right here. I had to relocate the power supply into the bay, one of the bays there. Um, Mounting it in the front was pretty straightforward. Now the I front is important because you have to have access to the CD-ROM drive for Wait. the PlayStation. You had a little trouble for the GameCube because it opens up. Yeah. So we had to put that on the top. I don't know if you can get that up here. But there you go. Hit the eject on it. And you can see, there's the, <laughs> there's the GameCube. You had to do that. There was no other way. Oh, and by the way, you, the get, way. you, you got the Xbox logo on there. Microsoft's ah, going to love that. <laughs> all right. I'm sure they will. What else? Look at these fans. Look at those. They're all lit up. Those How are they doing awesome. that? I got these from ThinkGeek. Um, they're basically LED lights with fiber optic tubing going onto the fan, and it just transmits the light through and spins. But now you got a little wacky, because, okay, so you got the GameCube, you got the PlayStation 2, and you got the Xbox in there. But then you said, what about retro? And we're not going to play MAME. We're going to play the real thing. We've got a Super NES. There's, there's Mario right there, baby. <laughs> so There's your cartridge, and you got an Atari 2600 VCS in there. Yep. I got can't. it all packed in here. Where, where is the Atari? I don't see <laughs> it. Atari's right here. And um, how do you get the get cartridge in? Shorter. Oh, I see. There's a, there's a on it. good lord. The Where'd you just get that? Sticks straight in from the side. <laughs> <laughs> and the Nintendo up here just. Oh, you were you were whack, out. man. That is wild. <laughs> How big a power supply to keep all this stuff running? Uh, 400 watt. Each of the little game systems has its own power so supply we don't have to worry independently. About them. Right. Yeah. 
and then everything, I used a 9-pin serial is, switcher to switch the video is, and audio. Is, is this just <laughs> for fun, the toggle switches on the front? Does that no, do actually, this is our PC power reset, our Nintendo power reset. Each one does reset. something. It, everyone does something. That looks it's like a reset it, or a It looks my, power. like my old Mitz Alt here. And this what's, is my yeah, what's AV the big selector. Knob? That's our AV selector. If we look over here at the So TV, we got it hooked up to a television set over on the, the other way. side. The there you go. Over there. You could change which one you're seeing. That there's our PS2. Get, get, our, the, get the shot of the screen behind them, guys. Yeah, we don't care about the knob. Over there. We care about the screen. <laughs> Watch the screen. So that's our Xbox. Go back. PC, PS2, Xbox, GameCube. Yoshi, and you're a madman. That would be the Nintendo. Which How much is did you spend? Terrible. Now, I'm not talking about buying the boxes, but you, the, you, the, we're, first of all, what kind of case is this? This is a nice case. Uh, it's a Lanley PC76, I believe. Oh, beautiful case. Did you have to mod it in any way to get all that stuff in there? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. What did you do? <laughs> um, I cut most of the bays out, all the hard drive enclosures. I had to go. I needed the room. I ended up mounting the hard drives vertical where the motherboard would normally go here. Look at that. So the hard drives all got in here rather than being flat underneath here. Um, everything was a matter of modifying. That is amazing. <laughs> Truly amazing. How much time did you spend? Oh, I don't know. You didn't count. I have a lot Which, of time What's good, though, is, is on the website, there's pictures. You took pictures every step of the way, so we could see the process bit by bit. We've got video and pictures on the website. There's everything a time-lapse video of it, too. Look, here, here we go. This is <laughs> Yoshi, you madman. Is this your house? Yeah, that's my apartment. <laughs> Did your roommates think there was anything odd about you at the? Uh... Oh, I luckily I live by myself, oh. so it doesn't matter now what know, I do. Now we know why. <laughs> yes, yes. Now we do know why. Hey, Yoshi, this is truly awesome. How much did we spend to put this together? We have any idea? All total in parts, around four thousand. Four thousand bucks. But folks, every game you could ever want to play in this box, and they all look great. What are you going to do next, Yoshi? How can you top this? Uh, I have a few ideas. We'll just have to. Keep watching. All right. Yeah, he does. He has some great ideas. <laughs> That's it. Yoshi's box, kids. Let's hear it for him. <laughs> to read all about the installation and design of this piece, hear about it for yourself from the man Yoshi at thescreensavers.com. Welcome back. Now with our new dueling 12-inch and 17-inch power books, Apple has us all pondering the question, is less more or is more more? Morgan and I think more is more. More is definitely more. More is always more. Yes. More. Yes. We, we are not the good things that come in small packages, no. girls. No. And you can get a lot more from your monitor than, you know, your 17-inch CRT that we all have for prize, right. 50 bucks or whatever they cost. Exactly. You can spend a lot. You can. On a monitor. <laughs> you can. A we lot. Found that. All right. So the first one we have, now this is a ViewSonic monitor. This is actually uses 802.11. You plug this little bad boy, your little wireless station, into the back of the computer. And then you purchase this monitor. This is $1,000, and then you purchase the base station, that is an extra $200. No, you would think it would come with the monitor, <laughs> but it doesn't. But let me show you what it does. No, so it just connects wirelessly to your computer, so it's going to work just like, you know, any computer. It is touch screen. You can write. You can move the mouse. There's some buttons on the side, that kind of thing. And you just navigate around. So the theory is that you can sit on, you know, put this on your lap, hang out, you're touching around on your screen. You can also connect a uh, keyboard. There's a USB on the top, which is cool. And you can, of course, have wireless keyboard and mouse attached to your computer. So you could, like, go to the bathroom with that thing. Sit it on your yeah. lap and just <laughs> check your email, that kind of thing. Exactly. And so you actually don't have to have already a network in your house. It comes, nope, with, comes with this little guy. Yes. It does come off the stand, actually, but um, I don't know if I charged it enough, so we're going to see if we take it off the stand. It's probably going to turn itself off. <laughs> Should I do it? Go for it. All right. Now, this is Microsoft oh, Smart Display <laughs> Technology. It was codenamed Mira for a while. Yes. But now it's actually out and available. I think you guys probably mm -hmm. saw some of this at, at CES, Ooh, show too. Show contents. Yeah, so this is, I mean, it's sort of like a tablet PC, but of course there's no actual PC in there. Right. You don't need the stand. That and it works with another extra. monitor. You, have, you can have, an, like, another monitor. I mean, the theory monitor. is that you have another monitor on your computer because it has to connect and do all this stuff. So you want another monitor. Right. This is not your primary monitor right. here. All right. All right. This, this beautiful yes. thing here. This is the 23-inch cinema display, which today, with the announce, Apple announced new G4s that are faster and cheaper. And this price on this actually dropped $1,000. Did Leo buy one yesterday or something? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that always happens. Whenever they, Apple like, decides to drop the prices on anything, he inevitably He's bought, bought one like day last day. Yeah, week for like 10 grand. All of a sudden now exactly. it's like $100. I'm going to give you. And, like, I'll, yeah. I don't know if you, I, did, I think you do have, you have the, the cinema. You have I have the 17. 17 yeah, inch. Yeah, I love it. This is the 23 that, inch I love display. That one. It's got 2.3 million pixels. Wow. Digital pixels. What do you do with so many pixels? Yes. You watch Ellen Feist, I guess. Exactly. And there's a few drawbacks to this, we got to say. 
way. One is it doesn't work. It only works with newer Macs. We had an mm. old Mac here. We could not get it to work yeah, it wasn't, for the wasn't longest really time. It. We had an emergency new Mac replacement. Um, <laughs> thanks to Kevin Bring and Dan in the Mac for doing stat. that. Yeah. <laughs> and the other thing, it's not going to work with your PC unless you buy an extra converter, which I think is about $300 and kind of a lot of trouble. But if you already have a new Mac, that think is not a problem. Think of the money you're saving because the price dropped. Take that extra exactly. $500, buy the converter, and you still have $200 left to put in your sock drawer. Right. This is a beautiful flat screen. I, I love it. Like for watching DVDs, this is amazing. You don't you don't need like another television. It's beautiful. No. Actually, yeah, that's what the rumor is, and we don't really intend to that believe rumors rumor. from Mac. But the reason they dropped the price is newer ones are coming out, and they're going to have HD TV compatibility. So cool. Ooh. All right, let's talk yes. about this bad boy. This is the 9X Media. Now, sad story with this one. <laughs> <laughs> this one actually came with three displays, but our friends from 9X who brought it, they fell down and dropped one. <laughs> they're, they're okay, though. But the cool thing about this is, okay, it does run, you know, you have three monitors, you're going to need three video outs on your computer, so you need, like, a triple-head video card, or you need, you know, one dual-head, or, you know, however you do it. So each monitor has its own uh, video out. But the cool thing is, is they're oh, yeah. modular, and yes. you can move them around, and you see, you can add Blue as many building. monitors in here as you want. They go in there and they have these little cat things here so you don't get dirt and garbage and in And then there. you just stick the new monitors in. You can make them three across. You can make them like two high and three across. And uh, You can also switch them to landscape or yes. you know horizontal and or vertical. they're HD ready. Right. And this is like, this is cool. They were showing you, you know, if you have this Excel worksheet you're working over here and then you want to make it bigger, you can stretch it all the way wow. across the screen. Have That's you ever so cool. seen Excel so exciting? Is it I exciting? It. <laughs> the cool use for this is, I know, like stock traders, that kind of thing. They're yeah. going to want to see like all their information, or you know, anyone who likes to play a lot of video games right. is going to love this. And you know, with the video cards are getting so cheap, you know, it's like that kind of thing. Like this technology is really coming down in price, becoming more available to the regular user. Right. But I don't think this is going to show up in my house anytime soon. No. <laughs> but this one, unlike the cinema display, this one does work with Mac or PC or Linux. Linux or yeah. Unix too. So which is and great. and when you move them out here, it's really it's it's more of like the you can see in your peripheral vision. Yeah, like, you can put them all around. You. Yeah, they're cool. Yes, this is and this Mega. is used for simulations and stuff. And that's actually the early adopter gadget lover who yeah. wants to, you know, wants. A lot of people are using multi monitors, you know. So. Yep. All Good right, enough. should we move on to the biggie? Let's do the mega. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Oh. Hi, Leo. Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, this is cool. This is very cool. You can't really see it that well right now because it is um, a little bit light. It's based on projector technology. The projector is right under right where Leo is. You can just look that up, actually, and you can... You can take a look at it. Did we say what this is? This is the Lumens 180 display. Yes, and the point is that it's in your peripheral vision. If you look, you know, you see up, you see to the sides, all you see is what's in there. And it connects actually just straight to the port on your computer. And you need a, any good graphics card. Let's take, let's drop the lights a little bit. Could I play, because uh, this would be so cool with Quake 3, because it really does go right out to the edge of your peripheral vision. Well, you need a little bit, uh, you need to adapt the software a little bit. Uh... And they, uh, they do offer, like, all that stuff on their website. You know ways that you can uh, adapt, like Quake, to uh, play on like this you're peripheral. Really in it. Because yeah. there's, so let's cool. uh, drop the light so we can take a look at it. Because yeah. when you run it, there's no look distortion on the sides, yeah. anything like that. No, it just goes right around you. Yeah. You and unfortunately, these things are about they're under twenty thousand dollars. Just dropped under twenty. Yeah. Under twenty. Under yes. just under just twenty. How much <laughs> under twenty? <laughs> nineteen five, starting at nineteen okay. five. Starting at, and this is the smallest one. You can actually get bigger and more expensive ones than this if you want. These are mostly they're used for flight simulations, they're used for big corporations, auto simulations. I can see an architect might do it for yeah. a walkthrough. Yes, yeah. they're used for like science museums. They're not even actually used in they, you'd think it would be cool in an arcade, but they're not even used there yet because they're, they're really expensive. Too expensive. But I think I mean I think with any technology the price is dropping and I would love to have one of these it's little yeah. My own, uh, well, in my own home. And I think soon, right I here. think games are going to start to be oh, uh, yeah. put into here. You're going to be able to play Quake. And as soon as you can play Quake in this thing, like really beautifully, yeah. with no distortion, can yeah. you even wait? Awesome. I let can you the, even wait? The man who, um, the head of Illumins, I think, he said he wants a dome in every home. <laughs> <laughs> Which I really like that. I want a dome you in know, my hopefully, home. Hopefully, like, the, the prices will drop and we'll all get to have one of these. You know, sure. I, I can imagine. 18000 Yeah, no it's, big it's deal. a very cool technology. Well, they'll go down to 10 any day now. <laughs> yeah. You'll buy one and then yeah, you have then to buy one drop. and then the price will okay, drop. Okay, I'll, like I'll that buy idea. one. I would like to thank everyone. I would like to thank everyone for bringing all these huge monitors here today, too. They came in the biggest crates ever. But, yeah. Very That's cool. It. You can go to thescreensavers.com to learn more about any of the monitors you saw here today, and you can also learn where to buy them if you have a spare. Now it's under 20 grand. <laughs> but, you know, or convince your corporation to buy them.
I think Tech TV needs it. one. I think so too. In my house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Stay the art of deception. You know him best as the reformed hacker who spent time in maximum security and made Free Kevin a household term on his release from prison three years ago. After serving a five year sentence, Kevin was barred from using the internet. That was the terms of his probation. For the first time in eight years, Kevin Mitnick is finally going to be allowed back online, and it's going to happen today. Welcome, Kevin. It's good to have you on the show. It's, a, it's a great to be Wish here. Wish my I'm publisher excited. had thought I'm about something excited. like this to plug my book sales. Man. <laughs> Perfect timing. Man. Huh? Man. Wow. I have it here. This is a letter from the United States District Court U.S. Probation Office. Somebody tore this open. I had to see what that was. I think was. you were a little you know, excited a little worried, when this came. You know, what could it be? Let's just, let's just uh, read it here. I'm going to cover up the phone number because... Uh, we don't want anybody to call him. But this is from Gregory, your probation officer. The purpose of this letter is to inform you that uh, as of January 20th, 2003, that's midnight this morning, right? Correct. Correct. You exactly. will have successfully completed your of federal supervision. No idea what that means. I wish you the best of luck in the future. That's nice. Very thoughtful. If I can be of any assistance, please feel free to contact me. And uh, you called him, right? Well, I called him this morning because I wanted to make... Absolutely sure. It's okay. There's no surprises. <laughs> now tell me the truth. 12:01, you got online. 12:01, we were uh, having a party in the hotel room. You were celebrating. And I had to I had to get up very early this morning for a CNN, and we were in. It was like we stayed up to 1:30, and I had to get up at four. Has this been something you've been looking forward to? Oh, of course. <laughs> I mean, I, I've been missing out. The internet is like kind of like having a telephone these days, and so ambiguous that uh, to be without it. Yeah. It's like. I couldn't use an electronic toilet without getting permission of the U.S. government. Right. They were afraid. Well, they, I know. They were afraid. I don't think it's a joke in prison that you could use whistle tones into a phone oh, yeah. and then hack into systems. Yeah, it's actually held in what they call the hole for eight months because they had a fear that if I had access to a payphone in detention that I could start a nuclear strike. Now, let's say this right up front. Hacking is a crime. What Correct. you did was a crime. Absolutely. You did your time. I'm sorry for what I did. Yep. And You uh, wouldn't encourage anybody to do that no. again? No. You know, sometimes I think every time we have you on, people I get letters saying, well, you're glorifying Kevin. And I want you to know, folks, Kevin's a great guy. We know, you know, we, he's a friend of the show, but he's reformed. He's not still doing this no, stuff. Absolutely. And he's not advocating. In fact, he's the best example of, of why you shouldn't do it. Why you shouldn't do <laughs> exactly. it. This guy did the time. You but we're glad he's free. I think they overreacted in your case. That's why the free Kevin movement was so big. It was more that the punishment did fit the crime, being held for four and a half years without, With, a, trial, without a trial. No bail hearing. Um, and what's interesting, in today's New York Times, uh, two federal dis uh, appellate courts ruled that it was overbroad, impermissible to restrict somebody from using the Internet as punishment. Yeah, yeah, and that's, and that's what they the did to you. Get off. <laughs> yeah, right. A little late for you, but maybe for the yeah. future. Have you thought a lot about what you're going to do the first time? Now, remember, it's not just the surfing the web. You can't send email. You can't do anything, right? Uh, pretty much could not touch Blackberry, the Blackberry? You couldn't have a Blackberry? No. My Darcy, my girlfriend, was kind enough to buy me a... Getting off probation gift, and it's a BlackBerry uh, 6710, I think. You're going to love that. Uh, Have you thought a lot about what you're going to do? Yes. First? I, uh, I, uh, a lot of lobbying. Last year, Darcy's last been year. lobbying. I know that you lobbying go to her Lobbying very site. hard. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, go ahead. Ladies yeah. and gentlemen. Well, wait a minute. No, no, no. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I just thought of something. Okay. It's been eight years. A lot has changed. Maybe we should have some experts come in and, and fill you in a little bit on what you missed. Give me some good ideas. Yes. Let me introduce Emmanuel Goldstein. Emmanuel is the editor of 2600, the Hacker Quarterly. He is perhaps the best-known spokesman for the hacker community. Do you know each other? Oh, very well. He, right. he actually st helped start the Free Kevin movement. All right, he there you go. So he got, and, and I see you brought some gifts. Yeah, I brought this for myself, but you can have, uh, you can have <laughs> some champagne. Uh, champagne. <laughs> right. You're celebrating. And, and to show you that times have changed, there's a new book out now called Takedown. Oh, no. Takedown. Not, not the Takedown that you're so familiar with. This Th is that's about, a book about you. No, about, no, no. That was another book. You don't want to read that book. This is a mafia. This book. might be a more interesting book. Yeah. The other book you don't want to read the is Fall the Marvel of the Last book. Mafia Empire. All right. So the title has been reused. That's very nice. Oh. All right. So some gifts. But that's not all. There's more. Oh. We've got John and Markoff in the. No, I'm just kidding. I, want... <laughs> I wouldn't do that to you. He wants you. to do a New York Times story. Yes, yes. I wouldn't do that to you. Emmanuel's going to advise you on one side, but on the other side, we thought we'd bring an, another friend of yours, a guy who's been on the show many times. One, uh, frankly, one of the, the guys who got the personal computer movement off the ground. Steve Wozniak is here. He's going to advise you on your angelic side. Mm -hmm. Steve, come on in. <laughs> hey, you brought hey, gifts, hey, too. Congratulations. Hey, thank you well deserved. What you brought you something? I, uh, and I believe you held out and didn't get on the <laughs> oh, Internet. Do you believe that? This <laughs> is for you. Look at this drawing. A little gift. And Who drew that? That's awesome. Um, I thought it up this morning, but um, our artist at the company drew it. Look I at can't that. Draw it. At the new, the new. I hope you enjoy it. So don't disturb the picture. And I'm pro-choice. So if you prefer a PC over a Macintosh, Darcy, I'm sure can 
Is this, you know, is this the new? Uh, is this the new PowerBook? <laughs> That's uh, it's it's the current one being sold. Oh boy, it's a good one. I'm gonna put oh this right God. here. And and to be fair, that's an Apple product. Yeah. Microsoft Office and some blank DVDs. Oh, oh man, <laughs> you Thank are. You. That is a nice gift. <laughs> Choose <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> now, guys, a lot has happened since 1995. What browser were you using in 1995? Were you online? Uh, I hope the browser still exists. It's uh, Mosaic. Ah, oh, bad it's news. Lynx. Bad news. Lynx is still around. I don't think you could still use Mosaic. No. I think there was this company called <laughs> Netscape. Came out of that. And then Netscape got bought by AOL. And then there's this guy named Bill Gates. You've heard of him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I actually met him. <laughs> yeah. yeah? I met him uh, over at Comdex at the Mandalay Bay. He wa they were having an after party. And I went up to him and I was shaking his hand. I go, hi, I'm Kevin Mitnick. Did he, he know goes, who you were? Uh huh. <laughs> and I go, Kevin Mitnick. He goes, oh, nice to meet you. <laughs> Boom. Yeah, he took off. <laughs> no pictures. <laughs> well, is there anything you would tell Kevin uh, about what's happened over the last eight years? God, I mean, I really think it's a shame that they kept you from this important thing that was happening, the Internet, when what you could do was so minor, especially if you were being watched or in prison or something, and you got to miss all the evolution of the Internet and sites, important sites that came into our lives, like and Napster? some of them, and many that, yes, and went away. And that's uh, a really good example. <laughs> the portals that came and went, yes. and the advertising came, and it got more and more and more, and you're inundated with it everywhere you go, and pop-up ads and all that. You have missed out, and you're kind of like, like a virgin, and you're just going to go at it for the first time. Woo! You're going to be slow getting around, I presume, because you well, haven't I, been I, doing I, I this. I hope you guys will help. Emmanuel <laughs> Goldstein, what would you tell uh, Kevin Mitnick? Any advice? Don't be afraid by the advertising because it's everywhere. Everywhere you go, you're going to see an advertisement or a pornography or an advertisement well, for pornography. Or, uh, well, there are ways. There, there, there's a group of people that uh, are, are dedicated to blocking advertising wherever you go. So we'll show you that as well. How about okay. hackers? Should he be worrying about hackers? I don't here? think he should be now, worrying about hackers. Do you think hackers. he's going to try to hack into my system? People are, are you kidding? He's going to be a major target, don't you think? What's Everyone your website? Would, uh, www.waz.org. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Waz, what's the first site he should go to? What do you think the first thing he should do on the internet? After Waz.org? I, uh, listen, the, infer the, the internet has just exploded with the amount of information you can get on anything you think of. You can type in, and sometimes you get results, and go to Google.com. Google, I heard of Number Google. one. Uh, what Number was the one? big search engine in 1995? Was it, was it Yahoo? The Yahoo yeah, wasn't Yahoo. even around. No, was it Yahoo around? wasn't around. Uh, what did he Yahoo use? Lycos? What did you no, use? No, no Yahoo was around. Was Yahoo around? Yeah. Just no, beginning. No, not in 95. Not Just when beginning. I was, not by the time. Emmanuel was, Goldstein, what's the first site he should go to? Well, I, I'd like him to go to 2600.com, but I think, I think Google is a good choice Google's because choice. you can type virtually anything into Google and you'll find, you'll find it. it. It's a line of dialogue in a, an obscure movie or something like that. Uh, it's it's really, amazing. It's I wonder a great if I tool. type in my name if I'll see anything. I bet you will. I think you I might. Leo's You've name. never done a vanity search. No. Here's a guy who's never done a search on his own name. <laughs> Patrick, you got any ideas for uh, maybe where uh, uh, Kevin Mitnick should go? I was going to say downloads.com because I actually found NCSA Mosaic version 3.0, which doesn't but, really run well. <laughs> That'll make him feel right at home. Hey, what do you think, oh, Yoshi, wait. Kevin, where do you think he should go? First site Kevin Mitnick ever I'm, goes to. I'm going to say Slashdot, probably. Slashdot. Yeah, yeah. What do you think, Yoshi? You I agree? I was going to say Google, but you know, you should also try Yoshi.us. Yeah, there you go. Oh, How about so you guys fun. in the audience? Where should he go? Let's hear it. Where is the first place Kevin Green Mitnick? Screensavers. Sure, Screensavers. Oh, All right, we've got a lot of choices. Yeah. Kevin Mitnick, it's yours to choose. Your first access to the internet, live, national television. You pick where you want to go. Okay, I'm going to do that, but you know, I also, I, I never sent an email yet. You never sent an email? Never sent an email. And i got to tell you a little story. Is Back in March of 2000, I was testifying before Congress uh, with Frank Thompson and Joseph Lieberman. And we had this dialogue, and Lieberman suggested I should become an attorney. And then I told him, well, there's a little problem. I, I have a conviction on my record, a felony conviction, and they might not allow me to be a member of the bar. So I asked Lieberman, I said, maybe one day you'll be in a position to grant me a pardon. And I just found out he's running for president. So you're going to send him an email? Yeah, send him an email. All right. Front, that ladies and gentlemen, you're going to hear first. Kevin Mitnick's first Internet Act, an email to Joseph Lieberman asking for a pardon. Yes. And we're going to check back and see what site you're going to go. Is it going to be Darcy's site? It's going to be Darcy's site. Lastmistress.com. You got the plug-in. You told the Times you had to do it. Guys, thank you so much. You could continue to uh, advise Mr. Mitnick on something that's completely unfamiliar to him. We'll check back again a little bit later on see how you're doing, and we will put a, a list of bookmarks, all the places Kevin visits over the next right. 45 minutes. Bookmark Control-D everything, okay, Kevin? Okay. And we will put a bookmark. Let's see it here. He's going to go Sony style. Now, Sony, did they pay you some money for that? <laughs> you better get it. Sony Vio. What kind of Sony Vio? All right, this. we'll check back in just a little bit, and of course, we'll have his bookmarks at the screensavers.com. Tech TV is bringing you more. More help and information.
more amazing documentaries, and more outrageous fun. Whoa! And it all starts with the shows that put Tech TV on the map. The Screen Savers. Demos, games, and special guests. Jason on the phone. This is help with personality and style. Now you know. Then, hot products and cool science. In the labs, behind the scenes. Tech Live covers the technology and entertainment news you won't find anywhere else. Always enlightening. Action. Always engaging. Tech TV is the place for technology news, help, and information. Then, go farther than you ever expected with Tech TV's new cutting edge documentaries. Everything you ever wanted to know about sex, but were afraid to plug in. Wired for Sex takes an eye opening look at sex in the 21st century. Then, technology and sports converge in Tech TV's runaway hit, Performance. Pushing boundaries and pushing the limits. Tech TV's new late nights are fresh, exciting, and unpredictable. X Play is the game show for video game fanatics. The hot new titles, gaming culture, and gear. Check it out! Then, hilarious, outrageous, and unexpected. Unscrewed with Martin Sargent. Late nights will never be the same. Let's move on. Okay, cool stuff. More people than ever will be turning to Tech TV for help, entertainment, and more. Shows that engage, thrill, and amaze. Ready for more? Tech TV. New things. Turn us on. <laughs>